uh, as a beginning. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the TADIT 2021 virtual conference. I'm sure you have attended other sessions already, and there are more very exciting ones to come. Uh, this, is, this session is workshop number five, part one, translating Chadwick control vocabularies. And I am Paula Sermoglio, greeting you from Argentina. I'm one of your moderators, and my other co-moderator or other moderator is Steve Basco. We're very grateful um, for the tech support of Lauren Kaiser and all the University of Florida conference team. Remember, this session is going to be recorded. It's being recorded, actually, right now for later viewing. Uh, we're very thankful that you're here. And during this first part of the workshop, we will give a very brief introduction to some important elements that are related to vocabularies. And then we will use the second part of the session to actually translate vocabularies into different languages. If you have questions, uh, you can use the Q&A uh, feature in Whova, which will, we will be monitoring that. There are two chats available in Whova. The one available from your Zoom screen is not persistent. The one that is part of the Whova platform will be able to be used and seen by anyone accessing the session on demand. Um, the chat function uh, has been made available for technical questions or for conversing among attendees. Please use it judiciously. And please bear with any technical difficulties that we may have. And so enjoy the session. So now we will start with any further delay with the brief intro to vocabularies. And so what I first want to try to do is to describe the different parts of vocabularies. And this might sound very spiny at first. And if you haven't worked with vocabularies before, it may seem a little threatening. But if you take the little parts, uh, you'll see that it's not that difficult, that complex. So even though it looks spiny, it's, it's not that difficult. So let's start with what, is a, what are vocabularies. So vocabularies are collections of terms or bags of terms. Some examples of Chadwick vocabularies are the Darwin core. You may have heard of the Darwin core standard, the Audubon core, and there are several controlled uh, vocabularies. So within vocabularies, the terms can be organized by their namespaces. And so, for example, in Darwin Core, we have some terms that have a namespace DWC and some others that have DC because they are taken from another standard from Dublin Core and so on. Now, each of the terms in a vocabulary has a set of characteristics. And the set of characteristics is listed here on the left of, of the slide, and we will go through each of those. So first they have a full IRI identifier. And what is this identifier? Well, it's a unique identifier for the term. And we can see it in, as a, in, in an expanded form, as you see here, as it looks like a URL, right? And it looks like a URL because we can take that usually, paste it in a browser and click enter and we get some information about it. We find out what it's about. Not necessarily every, uh, every identifier resolves. We might not find information, but if they, usually, they usually do. And one very important thing about IRIs, these identifiers, is that they never change. Once the term is set and it, it's given an identifier that stays with that term uh, forever. Another characteristic of the terms are what we call term names. And term names are abbreviations of that IRI because those IRIs, those identifiers can be very long and very difficult to look at and to understand. So IRIs can be abbreviated using the namespace. And so we get an abbreviation of the, of the IRI that we can more easily read, okay? But they mean the same thing as the full IRI. And as they mean the same, the same thing, it happens the same thing that 
that happens with ERI, they never change. So full IRIs and term names, that is abbreviated IRIs never change. Then each term has a definition, which is what is what does it mean, right? And this definition is normative in English. And normative means that it, we're prescribing the meaning of that term. And in English, we could change that definition eventually if, it, if, if we needed to, but that has to go through a complex process, okay, to, in, to include some change to, to that normative definition. We can have translations of those, that, of those definitions into other languages. And the translations are non-normative. That means that they don't have to follow a standard process to be changed. Okay, so we can change the definition and adjust it a little bit. And if we um, if we realize that the translation is not accurate enough, we can touch it here and touch it there to make it um, more precise. And and those changes can be done without, as I was saying, without following a very complex uh, standard process. They can be changed more easily. Aside from the definition, terms have labels, and labels are. Uh, pieces that try to briefly describe the term in different languages. Like, for example, we have here three examples in, in three different languages. This is uh, assisted colonization. You see that this is something that a person can read easily enough. It's short, it tells what the term is, is about, okay? And it can be changed in any language. As, as the definition, we can add labels in any language Okay, and we can change those labels without having to follow a, a very complex process. And then we have the type of term. And the types can be of, there are three different types that a term can be. A type can be a class, and that means the type of thing, a type of thing. And so, for example, we have a class identification in Darwin Core a class location in, in, in Dublin Core, which is also used by Darwin Core, by the way. Uh, another class in, here in Dublin Core, region of interest. Uh, it's, it's, there, there are terms that are talking about types of things, okay? Another class are properties, and properties refer to characteristics of a thing. And so, for instance, we can have terms that are included in a class that is uh, occurrence. And we can have properties that are, for example, recorded by, who recorded that occurrence. That's a property of, of the thing. And then we have a third type of, uh, of terms that are concepts. And those concepts are values that are used for properties. And these are typically the ones that use uh, controlled vocabulary, standardized uh, vocabularies. And something that is different from the other two types of terms, classes and properties, is that concepts use control value strings. We will see that in, in a moment. Terms can also have other characteristics, but we'll stick with these that are always present with the, with the term. And so for example, I'll give an example of each type. Uh, um, a class term here is AC, this is for all of them called service access point. It has a, an IRI, which is the identifier, the unique identifier that never changes. It has an English uh, label. See that the English label is something that people can read and has spaces and is human, perfectly human readable um, label. It has a definition, okay? Here is the normative, uh, definition in English, and it has its type that is class. An example for a property term could be format. And again, this will have a term name. You see that this abbreviated IRI, right? This with a namespace. And then we have the, we have the RIR, uh, sorry, IRI. We have a label, we have a definition, and we have the type that is the state telling us that it's a property. And for a concept term, we can have this one. That is, the, this, this concept is a JPEG. There is 
a type of a format for, for images. And he, this one is interesting because you can see that the term name, it's impossible to guess what it's about. However, the label tells us something that we, we humans can understand, okay? So it has the term name, which you see is the abbreviation of the, of the IRI. We have the identifier. We have an English label, the English definition, normative, the type, which is a concept. And we will use a controlled value string for concepts. This is the, uh, we use a controlled vocabulary for, uh, for this term. In this case, it's, it's a JPEG, image JPEG. So one uh, important uh, distinction for, we're here already talking about controlled value strings that are for use for, for concepts. So control value strings are, have to be strings that are easy to read, that are human readable. While, as we were saying before, IRIs are for machines to use and it's usually very difficult for humans to, to interpret them. Now, one thing that is in common between them is that they never change. IRIs never change and control value strings that are assigned to, to, to these concept terms never change. Some examples of properties using this, um, these two different things, that is properties may expect a control value string and other properties may expect an IRI. And so for example, for format, we have that the term DC format expects a control value string while this other one of these DC terms format expects an IRI. The same happens with Another term, this is a Darwin core term, establishment means. The DWC establishment means term expect a control value string while its pair, the Darwin core IRI establishment means expect an IRI. So if we're working with this term, we will try to put values like introduced for establishment means. But if we're using the IRI, we will have to go look for the particular IRI uh, that signifies that, that introduced. So let me expand a little bit more from this graph. I'm gonna smash two other things in, 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 in the slides that are labels on term names. Let's start with term names. Terms names we said that are abbreviated IRIs. Some of them are easier to read and some of them are impossible to read, okay, for humans. And as we said before, they never change because they're just abbreviated IRIs. And labels here, which is the thing that humans mostly understand, um, labels will be usually derived from control value strings, but there can be many labels. There can be labels in as many languages as we want. Okay, and those labels can change. We'll be working with that today. Now, there are two examples here to, to show you, very short. One example is this thumbnail image that we can get from this URL. If you click on this URL, you will get the image on, on your browser. So the type here is, AC service access point, and this has two properties. This has a format property and a DC terms, DC format and a DC terms format. One is, ex well, is expecting a control value string and the other one will be expecting an, an IRI, but both of them use a, a control vocabulary. So the, this property, DC format, uses a control value string that is image JPEG, and the other one, DC terms format, expects an IRI. And so we should put under that term, we should put this value that is the, the full IRI. Now, for this format, this JPEG format, we have an English label for that concept that is JPEG, and we have a definition that is in English is normative, which is media subtype for JPEG images. We could have, of course, let me let me step a little back a little bit. We can have this English label, as I was saying, in any language. 
Now, in this case, I believe most of the languages would use the same label. Okay, at, at least in Spanish, we call it the same thing. We call it JPEG, pronounced uh, JPG, um, but it's the same. Okay, for some others, we will see that these labels change from language to language, and sometimes they change a lot, of course. And so in the second example, this is an occurrence. This is this plant here that was uh, recorded um, some time ago, I guess by Steve himself in, in Nashville, Tennessee. So it's an occurrence. So here we have a, a, a class occurrence and we say that it has two properties. It has many more, right? It has many more properties, but we're going to <clears throat> focus on two properties that are establishment means and PWC IRI establishment means. Again, this one will expect a control value string and the IRI one will expect an IRI value. That is this identifier down here. And once again, this, the, the concept, the, the control value, the concept the has, a, has a label. In this case, this plant is introduced. There are some synonyms for that, an alien, exotic, non-native, non-indigenous. But this control value is introduced and it has a normative definition in English. For that, for that value that is establishment of a taxon by human agency into an area that is not part of the natural range. So this is defining introduced. And in this case, you, you can see uh, that it's, it's important that we translate this because we definitely don't use this definition in other languages and we don't use this, this label in other languages. And so for example, in Spanish, the, the translation of the label would be introducido, which has in, in turn its own synonyms in Spanish. And we can establish a definition in, in, in Spanish that is a translation, establecimiento de un taxón por acción humana, etc., etc. And the same we can do for, for Dutch. And don't ask me to pronounce this in Dutch because I'm, I'm terrible at it. But we can translate the, the label and we can translate the definition. And we can do this in every single language. And we, as we were saying before, we can change it over time easily enough to adjust it and to improve it. Hey, Paula, yeah. can, I, can I jump in and say a couple of things at the, at, on that last slide? Yes, sure, please. Yeah. So one of the things I was just going to say is that actually the label for uh, Introducido includes the stuff that's in parentheses. Um, I, I, I'd have to go back and look at it, but like um, in, the, in this particular case, I think there are two different terms that involve things that are introduced. And so like we distinguish between them by like, were they introduced on purpose or were they introduced accidentally? And so being able to have like for the label, being able to have this longer uh, explanation with parentheses and things like that, th that is, uh, it makes it really understandable for a human. Um, th the other thing I was gonna say, um, let's see, I, maybe can you back up a couple slides? Um, yeah, yeah, that's good, okay. So um, one of the questions that I always sort of is maybe in people's mind is like, why do we have these two different options for like having one term that expects a string and another one that expects an IRI? And this, um, the reason is the, the one that expects a controlled value string, this is like, it's controlled. So you, that string always stays the same, it never changes, but it's like easy for somebody to paste that into a spreadsheet and look at the spreadsheet and say like, oh, I know what that is. That's like the media type for JPEG. I, I totally understand what that means. The problem is that a lot of these um, properties, people have been throwing term, you know, for like establishment means, people have been using DWC establishment means for years. And so you may be um, aggregating data from a lot of people and they may not have been using a controlled vocabulary. 
So you don't necessarily know if DWC establishment means is going to have clean values that come from the exact strings that we have in this controlled vocabulary, or whether they just have some random string that somebody had in their database. On the other hand, the properties that expect IRIs, like people don't just make up random IRIs. So it's relatively safe to assume that if there's a value for the IRI, that it's clean. So you could imagine a process where someone would go through and go through 50 spreadsheets and do some kind of disambiguation process. And then for each of them, they would assign the corresponding IRI to the corresponding IRI property. And then that would essentially, if you saw a value for the IRI property, then you'd basically know, oh, this is clean and it's definitely from the controlled vocabulary. Whereas for the one with the controlled value string, you'd hope there's a controlled value string, but you don't necessarily know that. There's also sort of more philosophical reason that has to do with what Paula said about being able to like put the term in the browser. In theory, you could learn if you had the IRI value, you could you could discover more about the meaning of that term um, if, if you use the IRI value. That's kind of a, like a linked data idea. Um, but the practical idea is that it's unlikely that anybody would give a value for the IRI valued terms unless they'd already cleaned it and used something that was was from the controlled value, the controlled vocabulary itself, rather than just whatever popped into their head to type into a spreadsheet. So I don't know if that helps to explain a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Steve. So with that in mind, I want to have you noticed a couple of things that we've been probably already saying some of some of them and is to point out some differences between control value strings and labels so control value strings strings are short usually we don't use spaces for those strings they use only ascii characters but they they do look similar to english like they can be almost un, un, understood they are not in English, but or is it, they, are, they use uh, English words sometimes to, to paste it together. They're often camel case. So here in this example, native reintroduced. So you see that this is built upon English words, but it's not English. I mean, in English, that doesn't exist. And what's something that is important is that as, as Steve was mentioning also, is that they need to be easy uh, to type without, without variation in spacing and capitalization. It has to be easy for people to put it into, into, a, into a spreadsheet. Labels are full words or phrases in any language. So, and yes, my bad, I, didn't, I did not color the thing that was in, in parentheses before, but that's a very good example of, uh, of a complete phrase used as a, as a label. So we can use basically whatever we want here. We can include spaces, punctuation, and diacritics. And these are labels or things that are read by people. And sometimes they are typed, but we expect that they will pick them from, from, from a list once they have decided what, what they are talking about, what the concept is that they are talking about. And so some examples are native reintroduced and it's fair in Spanish and in Dutch. So you see that labels can be also in, in, in different languages. So with this in mind, I want to tell you what are we going to do here? What do we want to translate and why? And I chose this picture to, to pose this question because I believe that one little drop can have a very big impact and can multiply to other drops and make the thing go bigger, larger, and be more inclusive. And so the idea is that we're going to try to translate some terms, 
fun vocabularies as a Kickstarter for people to get engaged and start translating the same and other vocabularies into other languages. And this we keeping in mind that we are a very heterogeneous community. We have people from all over the world. We have a lot of languages that we could be using. And something that is super important is that people can understand what they are doing, what they are using. And so we believe that labels and definitions should be available for, for people in their own languages. Because from that, we are picking which concepts we are using as a value. Once we have selected the concept, which is the most important part, then, well, we, we can have a little table that says, well, this concept has this IRI, this control value string, etc. But the important part is to select the concept and bring in people the concepts in their own language greatly facilitates an understanding. So the idea is that today we're going to try to translate um, vocabularies for six different terms, three from Darwin Core, establishment means, degree of establishment and pathway, and three from Audubon Core, variant, subtype, and format. Here you have the more or less the amount of terms that are uh, to translate in it for, for each for each big big term. Uh, don't be uh, overwhelmed by what you see what you see here, 120 terms, don't worry. Many of those are like JPEG, which do not really need much translation. And so the idea is that we will try to translate this into as many languages as we can here with the people that is present in the session. And Steve is going to walk you through the logistics of, of, this, uh, of this workshop, what we're going to do next. We want to thank all the people that, is, and it, that has been involved in Audubon Core and in the Invasive Organism Information Task Group, uh, with, who have been working in this in these terms here for Darwin Core that we're going to use today, and of course to many other people that have been involved over the years with with vocabularies and with trying to make vocabularies more uh, accessible to people, and of course to all of you who are participating in this session. So with this, I'll pass it to you, Steve, for, for the logistics part. Okay, great. I guess I'm unmuted. So uh, I have just pasted into both the Zoom chat and the Whova chat a link. And um, that link should take you to this Google Drive folder. Um, so one thing that I do want to say is if you are uh, from a location that does not allow uh, Google Drive or if you don't have a Google account, please let me know. I, I have all of these, um, the spreadsheets we're going to edit available as just normal CSV files. And so you can communicate with me and I can like email them to you and you can email them back to me. But um, most, a, a lot of people have Google accounts. Um, so anyway, if you go to this directory, um, you will see, let's see, let me make my screen bigger here. Oops. Okay. You will see that um, there is a directory for each of the um, controlled vocabularies that, that people want to work on. So, um, and then at the bottom, there are some sort of reference sheets here. So the first thing that, uh, that you need to do is to find out what is the language code for the language that you want to work on. Um, and, and first of all, I, I just want to acknowledge that every language is important and uh, and I have, but there's also a lot of languages. I think I, I made spreadsheets for like 150 different languages for each one. So it's a little bit overwhelming to try to find all of the languages on the big uh, list. So what I did was um, 
this spreadsheet here, um, I went to try to find the most common languages spoken, like the most number of speakers, and also to guess if I knew someone was coming. So for example, somebody told me they were gonna do Zulu. Somebody said they might do Cambodian. So I put, even though Zulu and Khmer are not like, don't have a lot of speakers, I put them on this list to make them easier to find. So if you're going to do Zulu, for example, um, you, you're going to be able to find that uh, easily. Now, so if I go into a particular folder like uh, Pathway, then I can see here that there's a Pathway spreadsheet for each of those language, languages. So here's the one for Zulu right here. Um, but then there's also a whole bunch of other ones, the ones that I call rare languages. And this is where like the other 120 languages are, something like that. It goes, it go, the list goes on and on and on. So if your language that you want to do is on a rare list, I, I apologize. Uh, and doesn't mean you're, that I don't think your language is important. There's just a lot, it was hard to anticipate what people would be doing. So I would start by going to the common language spreadsheet. And if the language you want to do is not there, then there's this rare language uh, spreadsheet that has, um, uh, why is Zulu still in here? I moved it. Anyway, there's another 150 languages on here. Um, so you find the language and then once you have, so and you find the language and you decide which one of the uh, the uh, controlled vocabularies you want to work on. So I would start with one of the easier ones that only has like eight terms or whatever. And we can put that slide back up when I'm done. Now, when you get into the particular folder, so I generated these all as CSVs. Um, so, but when you click on one of the CSVs, this is what's going to happen. Um, it's going to show you the CSV in a form that's not very easy to edit. So what you want to do is go up here and say, open with Google Sheets. And what that will do then is to open that CSV as a Google Sheet. And then you can, you know, move it around, make the, the columns so that they that they overlap less. Anyway, just shift things around until um, it's easier for you to edit. So once you've done that, and, and this is actually how I will know what languages have been worked on. So you can see here, um, there used to just be pathway for language AA and CSV, but now I can see, oh, there's a Google Sheet for that. That means somebody is working on that. So once you have uh, opened the CSV and turned it into a Google Sheet, then I'm gonna, this is one that I use as just an example here. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to acknowledge the contribution of you as a translator. And so the top uh, section of each sheet is a place for you to, um, to put your name and in many languages that use uh, Latin characters, the, this may be the only thing you need to put in there. However, if your language is like a Korean uh, or Russian, which uses Cyrillic or Greek. So if you have your name in a local character set, other than Latin characters, please add that in here. For many languages, there won't be anything there. The same thing's true for uh, your affiliation. You can just put however you would like to be affiliated. And then again, if your affiliation is uh, in, in the language you are translating, if it uses a different character set, then, uh, then please provide that as well. Um, and so, and the last thing is, if you do have an ORCID ID, um, it would be great if you could put that in here. We're really encouraging people to use ORCIDs because this is a way to unambiguously identify you. It's not a requirement. If you don't have an ORCID, don't worry about it. But if you have one, please put it in there because uh, you know at some point 
we want to make this all linked data and, and this is a great way to link to you as an individual. So that's what's in the top part of the spreadsheet. And then the bottom part of the spreadsheet, each spreadsheet is going to have the, um, the, this is basically part of the term name. You don't really need to worry about this. This is really just a housekeeping thing for us. The, the things that you're going to care about is here is the English label. This is what you're going to translate. And then this is not actually a real translation. I just pasted some random Greek stuff in here. Um, so anyway, you will put your translation of the label here. And then you go over, here is the English definition. And then when you come up with the definition in your language, you put it in this column. So that's really where uh, most of the work is. Just uh, translate the label and translate the definition. And when you've uh, finished filling in all, all of the label and definition columns, you're done. Uh, and you can move on to a different one if you have the time and, and the interest. And then what we'll do eventually is pull all the data together. And um, let me show you um, sort of what the end goal is here. So this is actually just a, a demonstration page um, that I put together. I'm not a web developer, um, but we were talking about how we want to make, the, make it possible for people to choose things with their own language. So here is, uh, we, right now we only have two languages other than English available, but you notice if I change this to Dutch, now all of the, the term, labels and the term definitions magically turn into Dutch. And if I click on Spanish, they magically turn into Spanish. And then, uh, so if a person says like, hmm, I don't know what value to choose, they can look at the name and the definition, and then they can be directed to, okay, this is what you want to put in your spreadsheet if you're typing it. Probably they're not going to, we're not going to really show this to people, but again, this would be for maybe web developers. If they're if they are developing an application and they want to use the IRI as an indication that like this these are clean data, um, they could have a pick like a pick list where the person would just click on the label and definition they want, and then under the hood, they would be able to know what um, what this is. So we will basically turn what you do into machine readable data that developers can use. Um, to create a, um, an applications like this, either web applications or if they want to incorporate it into a, a standalone um, application, they could do that as well. So that's sort of the end goal of what we are trying to accomplish. The last thing that, the last information that we want from you, um, I put this, it's kind of, named obscurely, but I put the AA in front just so that it would show up first, is the field labels. So you'll notice that when I, uh, so, well, now I close that window, but when I um, use that application, the some parts of it were still in English. So for instance, it says de definition colon in English. Well, if we want to express the definition, we want people to to have the word definition in their own language. And, and also like there was a part of that application that said, use this value with DWC establishment means. So we also wanna be able to tell people, utilize este valor con establishment means or whatever it is in your own language. So, and this only needs to be one done one time for each language. You don't have, if you translate, three or five or whatever controlled vocabularies, you don't need to do this five times, but, but just one time for each language, please fill in what these things here would be in your target language. And, and that's the last step. And also <laughs> if somebody, uh, Paula's already checked the Spanish, but if, if we have a Dutch speaker here, please fix these. These are pasted in from, uh, from Google Translate. They're not 
uh, vetted by a native Dutch speaker. So, uh, but I put them in here as an example. So I think um, that is the task. And at this point, um, I will, we can just open things up for questions. If you understand, if you have questions about, you know, what we're trying to accomplish or the workflow, I hope it won't be too difficult. It basically open a Google sheet and start typing. <laughs> if you can find the right one for your language. One, one short comment. If there are more than one, if there is more than one person that is translated a single language, in that spreadsheet, you just list yourselves one after the other. And if you need a space to discuss among yourselves, because you will be all working on the same things, maybe, and you have, you may want to discuss, you just let us know when we can open a breakout room and move you there to. Uh, to talk about it as, as needed. So just let us know. Yeah, so, and, and I think the, I, I, Paula has already sort of um, hinted at this. I think some of them like DC format, even though there's like a, over a hundred of them, you can do those super fast. In a lot of cases, you can just copy and paste the English, the English label is gonna be an acronym like PNG or something. So you may be able to do those very quickly. And so if you're doing something like that and you're doing it for a language where we probably have multiple speakers, then you could do something like divide up the table and have, you know, say I'm gonna do rows one through 25 or something. But on some of the more technical vocabularies, particularly the pathway establishment means, those are ones where there may be somewhat more technical meanings to the definitions. And in that case, if there are multiple speakers, it might be good to have a breakout room because you may need to discuss what the best translation is. And I think is Quentin here, do you have any, uh, Quentin, if you have any comments about that, the, the pathway degree of establishment and establishment yeah. means are kinds of your baby. So if, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. If anyone has any questions on those vocabularies and wants some clarification, I'll be only too happy to help. And I'm kind of the person who spearheaded the um, the three Audubon core ones. So if you have questions about those, um, I would be probably the go-to person for that. And I'm going to be hanging out in this session and also in the later session as well to answer any questions. So Are Steve, there, yeah. thing, um, if you can share the link to, to the page you just showed before. And another thing that is raised in the chat is that we have ZH for Chinese, but we will need two different ones. For yeah, yeah. So I actually thought of that. And so if there, if there is, um, if someone is gonna work on Chinese, it'll take me uh, like about one minute to go ahead and generate those. I just wasn't sure. I, the languages were generated from like a list I downloaded from somewhere, but, but it may also be the case for something like Flemish and Dutch, if there's variants on that, um, we can certainly do that. So as, as necessary, I can, um, I can generate the, uh, the different character set versions. So yeah, I, I think I, I'll probably use H-A-N-S and H-A-N-T because that corresponds to the actual um, like ISO language codes. Um, unless uh, it doesn't matter, we can straighten that out later. But uh, so I will go ahead and do that right now. Is there, I'm trying to think if um, there's other uh, languages Chinese related languages that use Chinese character set, Cantonese, or anyway, if you have other things, there are a lot of variants on languages. And if there's a specific variant, it's quite easy to generate a different sheet for that. Just let me know and I, I can do that quickly. I will, I'll do the Chinese ones right now. So it, anyway, I don't think we have anything else to say. So uh, if you want, if you think that there are other people who want to um, 
to um, collaborate, just speak up and, and we'll work on getting you into a, a breakout room. Oh yeah, and, uh, and also language variants like British, English, et cetera. Awesome, go for it. So, uh, and I can, um, I can generate those variants as well. Just let me know. I think you, <clears throat> I'll put up Reading American. You read the GBIF website, which uses more or less British, so it's equal. But I think one of the but important that is a general things point, is but... there, there is no reason why, there's no reason why we can't have all of these variants if somebody wants to do the work. There's, you know, if somebody prefers to see British English, we can do that. Yeah, it's something to maintain the, and yeah, uh, that is true. where the languages are so, I'm talking over you, but sorry, where the languages are so close, like British and American English, and people are really familiar with seeing both, it's usually not worth it. Um, we've had some cases with GBIF, with translating into various forms of Spanish. And at the moment, we still only have Spanish. Um, and I don't know how it happens, but somehow there's discussion and they work out which phrasing is most neutral Spanish or something. So uh, although with some of our new work with specific websites targeting uh, South America or Colombia or something, there's maybe some requests to make a more particular ones, but it is quite a lot of extra work to then have people maintaining all the variants as well as the main language. So Michael, I, I'm just saying caution about trying to do too much. Most of the invasive species stuff was done by British English speakers. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, so, a bit of in there. Yeah, so one of the things that I didn't say that we didn't say is that there are many more terms in Darwin Core and Audubon Core that say this term should use a controlled vocabulary, and and Matt may want to talk a little bit more and Paula about what GBIV is trying to do to generate um, translations of those. These are the six that are listed here are the ones that have like official controlled vocabularies that are that are actually under uh, managed under the standards process. The, um, the ones, the other ones, the controlled vocabularies I think are being more established by just trying to determine what people are using in the wild as opposed to prescribing them. But, but anyway, uh, Paula and Matt, if you want to talk about that, um, you're welcome to do that. I will have to have a look and remember, yes, I didn't work on this system, but I can show people the system. Oh, can I share my screen for a moment, uh, whoever's host? Thanks. So we have a, let me go to the beginning. We have a fairly recent, as you can see, it's a, a year from last year, system for vocabularies. Um, we've only moved, well, there's four vocabularies in there. Um, I think only life stage is actually being used in production GBIF uh, processing at the moment. Um, I can't click the buttons because stuff's over it. Sorry, I have to make it smaller. Um, so life stage, the vocabulary that uh, we align the life stage term to in GBIF has 39 concepts. Um, I'll just pick adult. And we hey, have- uh, Matt, we cannot see it. We are seeing the, the main page of the registry still. Oh, uh, okay, sorry. Here we are. So we've got four vocabularies and only the life stage one, I think, is being used in production GBIF. Um, and this is as we test this new system um, and as we um, migrate some st work from the, the previous method. Um, the life stage vocabulary has 39 concepts, juvenile and, and so on. And there's sub concepts, as you can see here and uh, and here, um, so picking just adult. 
we have the labels in Spanish and Dutch as well as English. Um, there's the potential for an alternative label. Um, I don't, I don't have an example of that, but then, and we have hidden labels. So these don't show up if you um, use this for say a user interface, but these show up for um, data processing. So if someone writes uh, adult unsexed, then uh, in the life stage term, then we know that that's adult. The unsexed ought to be in the sex term. And there's sometimes hundreds and hundreds of possibilities for this. Um, I don't think we have a good process in place yet for how we manage the translations. They've um, been into English and Spanish as a testing of the system rather than testing of our translation process. Ola, were you involved on this translation or was it? Uh, well, have we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't actively translated, but rather grabbed uh, the values that were found in the data. And so the same, the same is yeah. true for the actual uh, terms. So if you look in there, you will see the terms that are mostly used. And we have been um, trying to put some order into it and trying to understand that, well, adult is, we, we can think of adult as a concept and try to map all the other values that appear there that refer to, or that could be mapped to adult. But those are not, that they have not been done from the concept up, but rather from the data uh, down. I don't know which is yes. up and which is down there, but this is an important thing for the vocabularies here in GBIF is that they are taken from the data. It's not a group of experts that has determined which are the life stages possible, but the other way around. And something, well, it, it will be super interesting to provide translations for each one, but so far, the only translations that are included there are the ones that were found in the data and that we could map identifying the languages. So you will see that some of the vocabularies don't have translations at all because they only have the mapping in, in English for the values that were found. And so something important for the work that we're doing today is that we're focusing on translating and not on discussing whether the definition is right or wrong. If you have doubts about the definitions of the terms that you're translating, that's another discussion. It's super valuable, but it's not for today, but it is for contacting the the groups, either out of Audubon Core or, or, or Darwin Core, under, under which the, the invasive species vocabularies are. So just focus on the translations and, and not on, on viewing if the definitions are okay. Yeah, just overall, this is a experiment. You know, we just think it's super important to go down this road of of liberating this knowledge to the world. And, you know, we're, it's an, what we're doing today is an experiment and, you know, we'll learn from it and maybe get more ideas about how to manage things. But one of the beauties of leaving the translations out of the um, standards process is that it gives us the ability to correct things, easy, it, to make them better incrementally. Um, we don't, it doesn't have to be perfect on the first try. We just get something on the first try and then we can improve it. So that's sort of um, the, the outlook that we have today. Uh, but I'm very excited we have such great participation. If this is a good time to break, I'm going to go ahead and open the breakout rooms. Um, we've had a request for French and German, and just let me know if there is an additional request, and I'll be happy to make another room. Great. And, and I also should mention, I generated the new um, traditional and simplified Chinese. The simplified is H-A-N-S, Z-H dash underscore H-A-N-S, and traditional is Z-H underscore H-A-N-T. So those are ready to go. Let me know if there's any other ones that people need made. So Steve, there is a very interesting question uh, 
from Jorid. Uh, he's asking that the saying that some ontologies already have translations. And how are we going to put those together with the work we're doing here? Yeah, well, um, these the six vocabularies that we have here, to my knowledge, don't exist as um, as ontologies. There, that doesn't mean that the um, that this has come from a vacuum. The the three establishment means related uh, terms came out of a very long discussion and uh, a process that Quentin was leading. Uh, and, and so that's been fairly well vetted with that the invasive species community during that process. But I don't think there is another ontology that covers those very um, specific technical things. The um, I think it's AC uh, subtype. I did pull those from one of the Getty vocabularies, which um, is not, I don't think it's defined as a formal ontology. I think they use SCOS thesauri, but um, those, most of those terms were only available definitions in English. So I, I'd originally thought I might be able to draw from other languages there, but I don't think they've actually been translated. And then the, uh, the source of all of the DC and DC terms format ones comes from the uh, IETF, uh, the list they maintain of all the media types. And so the, the controlled vocabulary strings are all basically media types. Those are all standardized. But and the uh, but I'm not aware that, I mean, maybe there's an ontology of media types somewhere, but at, at this point, we're not, it, the, the um, ontological relationships between things are very simple. There's a few cases where we have broader and narrower categories, but that's about it. There's no, there's no more complex semantics than that. And, and SCOS handles broader and narrower. And so that's what we're using. I don't know, Yor, did that address your question? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Sure. So there are French and German breakout groups, but nobody seems to be joining them at the moment. Uh, maybe people don't know how to get in there. Exactly. <laughs> uh, in, Zoom, yeah. in Zoom, uh, if it should have at the bottom menu, uh, join breakout room, or with the dot, 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 and more, you could find the join breakout room. I can't see any of those. Um, Next to share screen somewhere down there. Yeah, I just seeing they divided into groups, but I cannot. I see the two rooms, but I cannot get it to. Okay, I, I can see button. a join join button and divide in groups. Yeah, yeah. So do, use the join button. Where is the join button? Harry, I can assign you as well. So if you'd like to move oh. over now, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, thanks. That would be nice. Um, so there's a question in the Q&A from Mariko uh, I, that I, I don't know if she would like to clarify it. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure uh, that I understand the question. Um, uh, this is Mariko. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the uh, nice uh, introduction to the translation project. So my question means that the, I often uh, do that the translation and it, also the consecutive interpreting from English to Japanese or Japanese to English. So uh, oftentimes this um, type of a project uh, presents in a way that uh, here's a project that contains, uh, you know, this is a document containing X excess number of, uh, you know, words or characters that need a translation. That, that gives the translator the estimate of how, how, how long does it take, you know, how you plan ahead that, okay, you know, I'll, I'll try to translate the 200 words a day or something like that. So if you, you could give, give us a so, sort of a, you know, 
it, you know, just a ball, ball, ballpark number of the uh, the size scale of the project. Yeah, That'd be wonderful. That's a little bit. I, I could probably do a back of the envelope guess on that. Um, but that one slide that Paula posted with the um, number of terms, most of the term labels are, I would say one to three words. So if you say an average of two and the there's probably maybe 300 terms total. So there's probably about 600, um, about six, yeah, let's see. Okay, fit, maybe I'm, okay, I'm overstating. 120, 150. Okay, so it looks like maybe a little over 200. So there's probably about 400 words in the labels. The definitions, again, it's like a little hard to estimate that. The establishment means pathway and degree of establishment. Uh, definitions are fairly long. Uh, well, not always, but they, they, they're more technical terms. And so they may have, I don't know, 10 or more words per definition. Whereas for some of the Audubon core ones, you know, they, they're shorter, they may be three or four words. So I don't know if that, um, yeah, so, so there's probably about 400 words in the labels. There's probably about 2,000 at least in the definitions. That's just a guess. Thank you, Stephen. 